On July 12, 1973, the world of classic horror lost one of its greats. His first name was Creighton, but we all know him now as Lon Chaney Jr. And 40 years later, his impact on classic horror movies, classic monster movies, and just classic film in general is still felt. And we're going to celebrate that here on this week's episodes of Monster Kid Radio. My name is Derek M. Cook. I'm the producer and host of the podcast where we celebrate the classic and sometimes not so classic genre movie of yesteryear. This time around, though, it's definitely classic cinema that we're going to be talking about when we talk about Lon Chaney Jr. and the impact that he's had on monster moviedom and author Paul McComas. Paul McComas is my guest this week. He's the co-author of the book Fit for a Frankenstein and probably the biggest Lon Chaney Jr. fan that I've ever had the pleasure to speak with. You're going to find out a little bit more about him when I have him here on the show here in a few minutes. The music you heard at the top of the show is from the Atomic Mosquitoes. It appears, with permission of the band, the song is Planet from Outer Space, and it appears on their album, Release the Mosquitoes. There will be a link to what they do in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. You'll hear the song in its entirety at the end of the episode. You'll also find a link to Paul's website, which is paulmccomas.com. That's Paul, P-A-U-L, McComas, M-C-C-O-M-A-S, dot com. At our website at monsterkidradio.net, you'll find links to our Facebook page, our Facebook group, our email address, which is monsterkidradio at gmail.com, or our voicemail line, which is 503-479-5MKR. Do you have a favorite Lon Chaney Jr. movie? Call in and let me know about it. Also out of our website is a link to our YouTube page where I post classic horror movie trailers, and I just updated that, added a trailer to a movie that I'm going to be covering here on the show in the near future. I also have an Amazon store link. I've had some of you ask for links to some of the books and music that we cover here on the show. If you click on that button, it's going to take you straight to our Amazon store. I call it the Monster Kid Laboratory. And you can pick up some of the books or music that we talk about here on Monster Kid Radio. If you buy any of these books or music from this link, we get like a penny or two back, so it helps support the show. All right, I'm done chatting. Let's get Paul McComas on the show. I'd like to welcome to the show an author, uh, the man behind the books, Planet of the Dates, Unforgettable, and the recently released Fit for a Frankenstein. He's also probably the biggest Lon Chaney Jr. fan that I've ever had the pleasure of speaking with, Paul McComas. Welcome to Monster Kid Radio. I am honored to be here, sir, and I am honored by, uh, by that title of, of biggest Chaney Jr. fan. It's not a contest. So other junior fans out there, I, I'm not trying to usurp uh, your position in whatever hierarchy exists. We can all be in a great big tie, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but, okay. but how many fans out there started a fanzine, Connie Jr., when they were, what, 11, 12? Yeah, and ran it for 24 issues. There was supposed to be 24 monthly issues, and we almost made it. I'd say 24 issues that came out about every six or seven I had a mimeograph uh, machine in the basement that my mom got me for 30 bucks, which was no small amount back then. Um, we're talking 1973. And uh, you remember the mimeograph machine with the big drum and uh, the purple ink uh, carbon sheet. And uh, you would tr- literally crank a handle to get those things out. So once every six, seven weeks, I would go down there with my 10 to 13 page fancy and crank the handle. For a nerdy horror fan like me, that's probably the best exercise I was getting back then, carrying <laughs> uh, that big drum, and uh, and put this magazine out. Advertised it in Famous Monsters of Filmland. I believe it was number one o two. I could be off by an issue or two in their classic Hyde ads, H Y D E, of course. And not only did I uh, attract a readership of well, over the course of the twenty four issues between eight and 25 readers across the country and a couple in Canada, but met a couple of people who became and still are among my very dearest friends in the world. Greg Starrett, with whom I co-wrote Sarah Frankenstein, the new novella, 
and uh, John Scott, to whom Unforgettable is dedicated and uh, with whom I co-wrote a, a piece in that book called Project Android. You just never know where these are, things are going to go once they start. And I suppose the real start was a couple months before the first issue of Lonnie Jr. when Lon died. And as we know, 40 years ago, it was July of 73. I was 11. Do the math, I'm 51. And it, a piece appeared in the Milwaukee Journal. I was growing up in Milwaukee, and it, it was a, an obit with his picture and list of his, you know, some of his major credits and a little bit about his life. The last thing it said was his final wish was that his death not be publicized. Cheney was a fair man, actually. And I, I was really upset by the fact that Lon had died, and so I guess I needed to take it out on someone. So I decided to become infuriated by the fact that they had publicized his death when that was his last not to be publicized, and had put it at the end of the article. It almost felt, felt like, a, like a, a tweak or an insult or something. So 11 years old, I wrote to the Milwaukee Journal, letter to the editor, how dare you, you know. And it was actually written in a fairly adult way until the last sentence. Uh-huh which was basically, uh, I hope that on the next full moon, he comes out of his grave and bites you. <laughs> well, that letter ran Milwaukee Journal. Oh, no. <laughs> I was pretty proud of it at the time. And I remember my friend saying, you know, Paul, it's, it's a good letter right up until that last sentence. Whereas I thought that was kind of what made the letter. You know? <laughs> so rife with success uh, at, at that early publication of my letter. <laughs> In defense of Lon's legacy, spirit, last wish, whatever, I founded in August the Lon Chaney Jr. Fan Club. And uh, I believe the first issue came out uh, in early September, right before the school year started, and uh, ran for, for 24 issues total. Yeah. What was the uh, first Lon Chaney Jr. film you'd seen? I think you talked about this in Lonnie Jr. at one point. What was the first one? Boy, you've read Lonnie Jr. more recently than I have because I, I, I could make copies of a few representative issues and sent them to you. Right. Um, but I haven't really gone back and forth through it in a while. i got to think that it was one of the Wolfman movies. Yeah. I don't think it was original because um, it took me a little while to see that. You know, we were waiting until our UHS station's uh, shock theater program uh, would bring it around again in the rotation. I think it was House of Frankenstein. Did I say something different in one of the No, magazines? I think I was right. It, was, it wasn't the original Wolfman. So that's I, yeah. I found that interesting that it wasn't pretty much the, the quintessential Wolfman film. It was yeah. one of the, the later films that, that hooked you. And I was going to ask, right. what was it about the Wolfman that just grabbed your imagination and wouldn't let you go? Oh, God. It was, it was what I would call Cheney Jr.'s forte, engendering sympathy in the viewer. You always felt, felt so badly for him, his pathos the poignancy of that performance, which you can see not only in Talbot, I mean in spades in Talbot every time, but in Lenny, obviously, in F. Bison Men, in uh, former Sheriff Martin Howe, in High Noon, um, in Man Made Monster. Should have seen it more in Ghost of Frankenstein. I think he was misdirected in that film. You've got the guy who played Lenny as the Frankenstein monster. So don't, first of all, Jack Pierce, don't cover his eyes with such heavy lids that we can't see the light inside. And then the director, I think it was Earl Kenton, you know, don't tell Cheney to just be an automaton. Say, channel Lenny, go back, grab a little of that Lenny, you know? But House of Frankenstein, I'm pretty sure that was the first chain in your film I saw. And halfway through, when he came on the scene, bang, that movie took off for me. It was good before, but it suddenly got really moving and important, you know. And the line that sticks with me, and please breaks my heart, mm-hmm. you probably are going to see this coming, is when um, Elanka is, is flirting with him as he drives the carriage. You know, he tells her his name is Lawrence, and she says, do people call you Larry? And he says, they used to. Mm. Oof, they used to. Before I became this fiend, you know, through no fault of my own. My God, you know, he was doing a thing. He was, he was putting his life on the line to rescue this, this gal that he'd just met, you know, the girlfriend of, of the woman he's interested in. And he pays for it as no one ever should. It, it's just so unfair. And honestly, maybe this is part of it, too. <laughs> You grow up, as so many of us did, not a popular kid, a misfit, bullied, teased, mocked, sometimes beat up. 
and uh, through no fault of your own, is a kind of curse. I think a lot of us monster kids never really fit in our peer group, didn't color inside the lines, and we're kind of proud of it, Derek, you know? Sure, That's, sure. They say we were set us apart. And so I, I think that I related to Talbot and other sympathy engendering uh, Cheney characters on the level of uh, the outcast, the one that the villagers or uh, the popular kids <laughs> would be chasing with torches or their equivalent. On some level, too, you're then rooting for the wolf man himself, aren't you? I know I, know I was, you know, uh, not in terms of innocence, but in terms of sticking up for himself. I, you know, this is getting deep into some kind of uh, um, <laughs> psychological deconstruction. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking consciously in those terms at 11, 12, 13, 14, of course. But now as I look back on it years later, having studied psychology, having much better understanding of the human condition and of myself, and having become something of a film scholar, I'm able to kind of put two and two together, and it all makes sense. The fact that I put out a fan scene for 24 issues, I was editor, I was publisher, I was writer, I was illustrator, I was in control. The fact that I made about 50 short horror, science fiction, and comedy films between the ages of 11 and 17. I was writer, I was director, I was uh, one of the actors, usually not the lead, that was John Scott. Usually I was the heavy, much like Lawless typecast, uh, by myself. <laughs> I, so what am I doing there? I'm in control. You know, I'm not in control at the schoolyard. I'm, I'm, I'm the smart, creative kid who A, doesn't fit in, and B, doesn't shut up about it either. You know, he's proud not to be a part of that damn crowd. But at home, and I must miss my circle, smaller circle of friends, two of my best friends, by the way, were not even from my school system. You know, they, they, in the city of Milwaukee, whereas I was in a suburb, and so I was going outside of, of my immediate milieu to find kindred spirits who were into the same things I was. I'm talking about John, and I'm talking about Julia, and they're in you know, a lot of my movies with me. But, you know, a filmmaker at that age, to be an editor-publisher at that age, you're in control in a way that I was never in control amongst my immediate peer group at school. And I have a feeling that as this podcast goes out, there's an awful lot of people out there, guys and some gals, nodding their heads right now saying, that's a version of my story too. Oh, sure. And the monsters gave us solving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who know me either through my various podcasting or whatever also know that I used to make movies growing up. I was always the director. I was the writer. I was the star. I was the special yep. makeup effects guy, you know, that sort of thing. You know, yep. I was also a writer growing up. I was that creative kid, didn't have a lot of friends, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm nodding my head, you know, listening right, to your story. Right, good. So. right. Bringing this back to Lon, I think he had some of that too. This was a guy who lived in his father's shadow, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. First of all, those who've seen the James Cagney uh, biopic, Man of a Thousand Faces, uh, that last scene is total fiction. Well, a lot of that movie Cheney, is total fiction. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it is. <laughs> right. And that last mm -hmm. scene where while he's dying, Lon Sr. takes a piece of grease paint out and adds Junior after Lon Chaney on his makeup box. No, Chaney Sr. forbade his son Creighton uh, from following in his footsteps. And Creighton uh, initially pursued a career in business and apparently with some success, it was not until after his father had died and he was starting to find his way out of that shadow that he did what he had wanted to do. You know, his dad was, was obviously a genius, and uh, Lon looked up to him but was forbidden to, uh, to follow in his footsteps. And then when his father died, he was freed in a way and, and got to it, but always under the shadow, starting with the fact that several films into his career, they said, can we call you Lon Chaney Jr. instead of Creighton? And he really didn't want to, but he had to do it to get the gigs. And then a film's later, can we drop the junior? And, of course, I'm saying it as questions. These weren't questions. These, these were orders from the studio system, right? We're dropping the junior now. You're going to have the same name your father did. So I think that uh, while his issue may not have been bullies and, and the popular crowd or anything like that, he also had this huge obstacle hovering over him all the time and uh, trying to get out from other his father's shadow and establish himself as an actor in his own right, I would argue that he did. And ultimately, I would say, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not objective about this. I think he accomplished more. 
I, I think the range of his characterizations and the depth of his characterizations surpassed what his father wow. did. There are going to be a lot of people out there who disagree with me, but um, his acting career was much longer seniors because, you know, uh, Lon Senior had to kind of wait until movies were happening as an industry to get into it. But if you look at the, the range and the depth, uh, I think that uh, Cheney Jr., um, it's one of the great, uh, put it up there with John Carradine, who did 400 movies, you know, <laughs> just one of the great bodies of work in, in American yeah. cinema. Well, and I, I'm going to talk about this in the introduction to the show. Uh, on this episode, I've already mentioned it. When you think of the classic monster movies from Universal, yeah. You know, there's th there's three big yeah. ones, Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Wolfman. And I don't think you have the success of The Wolfman without Lon Chaney Jr. in that role. And then Lon Chaney Jr. would go on to play more movie monsters than, than any of the big three. You know, Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, or himself. You know, he played The Wolfman. Right. He played Dracula. He played Frankenstein's monster. He played The Mummy. Yeah, yeah, show the mummy, and I call it Big Four. Some people would add the creature from the Black Lagoon, but that's a little later. So, yeah, you think in terms of Big Three, I think think in terms of Big Four, and 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 Cheney played yeah, them all. Yeah, definitely. He played yeah. the mummy. He's the only he played one the mummy three times, didn't he? Yeah, three times. Yeah, three times. And uh, he hated the role, of course. There's not a lot to do in there. He still has some effective moments with his body language and some of his hand gestures and that sort of thing. The third Mummy film has one of my favorite sequences in um, Universal Horror, but it's not a Cheney scene. It's when uh, Virginia Steen, uh, playing Ananka, emerges from the construction site. Um, and uh, it's just a remarkable piece of work. She's you know, she's been in the mud for 3,000 years. She digs her way out. She's blind. She's streaked with mud, and she stumbles her way over to the swamp and emerges beautiful with her hair done and makeup. But, you know, it is supernatural, so we can, we can give her that, I think. <laughs> the film is sped up, which gives her this herky-jerky look. Unfortunately, if you would look at the tree shadows, you also see that they're herky-jerky. But um, it, it's just a magical sequence, and um, in, in some ways, I think it's... It, <laughs> The book ends to the original Mummy, which is a, obviously a freaking masterpiece with Karloff. Um, and in a way, it's like, okay, there's been some banal stuff in between, but watch this. We are going to go out with a bang. Um, and he has some nice moments in that film, too, particularly at the climax um, um, when, when he's alone in the, in the uh, cell with, with one of our bad guys. Doesn't explain how the, how the, how the Mummy and an, um, and Anaka get uh, from Maple, what is it, Maple? <laughs> <laughs> up on the east coast down to uh, Bayou Country in Louisiana. Um, but, hey, it's super Yeah, there, right? there's a lot about the mummy films yeah. that don't, you know, the continuity <laughs> of the chronology and the geography don't quite make right. sense. Someone crunched the numbers and said that the mummy's curse logically happens in the 21st century if you, you crunch all yeah, the dates. If you, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you can't take that away from the... I mean, I like the movies. I love the Mummy film. I'm a huge Mummy oh, yeah. fan. I think Lon Chaney Jr. Yeah. was one of the best yeah. mummies out there. Uh, so yeah, he's he fantastic. But he really had a chance to do what he wanted, you know, what he could do best, I suppose, with the Wolfman uh, character. Yeah. I mean, and, and we'll probably talk about some of his other roles, you know, some of the underrated you know, roles. But sure. we got to talk about the Wolfman. That's pretty much what made his Absolutely. career, I mean, started him down the path of... Of a, of a horror icon. I know he did a horror movie beforehand, a monster movie beforehand, Man but The Wolfman was the one that set right. him up. Right. He also did a science fiction film beforehand. Under oh, Tina. that's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Captain Hacker. And I, I did a version of Undersea Kingdom. Episode 13 picks up where <laughs> <laughs> the seri uh, serial's episode 12 ends. And uh, actually, my next no-budget theater is called uh, Punks, Subs, and Saucers. And that subs part is my little eight-minute uh, final episode 13 of Undersea Kingdom with, of course, me as Captain Hacker, uh, wearing the skirt <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and a swimming cap that I've painted uh, dark with the fins coming out the sides of it, just like Hacker had, and reprising some of Hacker's classic roles like, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, so he had the, the science fiction role of Undersea Kingdom. I would say the science fiction slash horror role in Man Made right. Monster. And, and also, let's not forget, Akoba in 1 million BC. Yeah, and actually, uh, over on another one of my podcasts, the Hammer Films podcast, we're covering the Hammer Films version of 1 million years BC. So, uh, yeah, I actually just rewatched this one as well, uh, the original with Lon Chaney and company. So. Yep. 
I, I did too. But everyone raised your hand if you um, had the Raquel Welch 1 million BC poster up in your childhood bedroom I mean, at some point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no insult to Carol Landis. Uh, she's, she's wonderful in, in the original. Chaney's quite good in the mm-hmm. original too, as Akoba. One of many roles where he's playing consi- uh, considerably older than his years. A young man playing the father of Victor Mature. And and then later he would play um, the aging arthritic mentor to Gary Cooper Mm -hmm. in High Noon. Coop was 51 and uh, Cheney was 46. And High Noon, and is it because of of Cheney? Well, that's certainly a (laughs) bonus, but no, it's it's, it's chiefly because it's brilliant on multiple levels. 1952 and obviously decades before the TV show before, this is a film done in real time. It's an hour and a half in a in a town's life, and and uh, it it takes you know running time is about the same. I love it because it's an allegory against McCarthy, you know, made by people who had been or were about to be blacklisted. Virginia Farmer, not to be confused with Virginia Christine, she hadn't worked in a couple of years in Hollywood, but they put her in the uh, church scene, and she's the only woman who speaks up during that town meeting there, and she basically says. Uh, I can't believe what's happening with you people. You talk and you talk and you talk and you let this town go down the drain. You know, where's your where's your nerve? Where's your courage? Words to that effect. Well, she's talking about Hollywood, not Hadleyville. Same first letter. And the Miller gang, same first letter as McCarthy. By the time High Noon's screenplay lost at the Oscars, having made it, uh, Carl Foreman, who wrote it, was living in Europe because he couldn't get a job in Hollywood anymore. So I think it's a very brave film uh, that's using the most traditional, the most conservative of genres, the Western, to make a, a very progressive statement. And I would say a patriotic statement, because there's the patriotism of Casablanca, where you're rallying effort for uh, America to join the good war and, and defeat the Nazis and, and the Axis powers. That's patriotism. But it's also patriotism to say, look what's happened to our country. Now the threat is domestic. It's, it's Joe McCarthy from <laughs> my home state of Wisconsin, and it's uh, the House on American Activities Committee. And now patriotism means standing up for what's right, damn it, even when everyone else around you is finding an excuse to take the coward's way out. So, uh, I, and I love, I love the look of the film, all of those scenes outdoors, the sky goes to pure white, and that's intentional, and it's to make the day look even hotter than it is. The high noon montage when when the clocks all go to 12 and Miller's train is coming into Hadleyville. And then there's this rhythmic editing. Every fourth beat, we cut to a new shot of one of our characters or one of the sets just checking in. Where is everybody right now? They're at home. They're at church. They're not with Marshall Will Kane, that's for sure. And so, yes, he's going to have to face down the Millers by himself until Grace Kelly, as his wife, jumps off the train that's going out of town when she hears gunshots and helps him. So it's also a proto-feminist film. There are three people of character in that town. Two of them are women. There's Marshall Kane, there's his bride, Amy, and then there's Katie Hirado's character, Helen Ramirez. And by the way, 952, a positive, non-stereotypical depiction of a, a Latina, pretty rare. So this is an amazing film on multiple levels. And then the icing on the cake is Cheney with this great late performance. You know, not that late. He would act for another 20 years, but um, uh, it certainly passed his heyday as former Sheriff Howe. Broken knuckles, arthritic. When Coop goes to visit him in, in Howe's house, his little hut, Cheney sits almost paralyzed in that chair to show just how unable he is to do anything to help. And he, and he mutters that I think Carl Foreman uh, he's giving Cheney the chance to speak the message of film. People have to talk themselves into doing the right thing. And by then it's too late because ultimately they don't care. They just don't care. It's a very cynical message. Cheney delivers it with pure commitment. So that's my five minute monologue. <laughs> no, it's fine, man. <laughs> <laughs> On some of the joys no, of and- noon. You know, Cheney did a lot of Western work. I mean, he, he wearing a cowboy hat is mm-hmm. natural, I suppose. After you watch some of these movies, he, he did a lot of Western yep. as well. He's not just a horror or monster actor, and I think that's important that's to kind right. of remember about this. It, yeah. it is important. It is important. He's, he's a master character actor, and even within the Westerns, wasn't a cowboy hat. You ever see his, his turn as Chief Pontiac? Sometimes it was the Indian headdress. A wonderful, non-stereotypical performance as Chief Pontiac. And <laughs> compare it with Johnny Depp wearing a dead bird. Said, "I mean, where's the progress? 
This was a role Cheney did back in the 50s. And with a great deal of respect and, and obvious affection for the character he was playing, a, a noble uh, Indian chief who is, is seeing uh, his world evaporate before his eyes, replaced by the world of the white man. And, of course, we have to go way, way back to uh, 1939 and Lenny. Amazing chemistry between Cheney and Burgess Meredith. Um, a terrific film, certainly one of my, my top 20, uh, the, the, the original of Mice and Men. And I like the Gary Sinise, John Malkovich, but... Um, I'm actually really you know, surprised that you know. we went from Of Mice and Men to the monster movies, because I, I think of Mice and Men, it's, mm-hmm. it's such a personal, deep touch story. And I'm not saying that there aren't those moments in The Wolfman, yeah. but I mean, really, it's, it's just a different type of film. I feel like his career could have gone in a different direction. And mm-hmm. it's, I mean, I'm grateful that we got him in our... You know, our monster movies, don't get me wrong, but it's yeah. it's interesting to watch yeah. something like Of Mice and Men and then turn around and watch something like, you know, The Wolf Manor or Son of Dracula or something like that, because it's, right. it's a completely different performance and shows his range. It does. In a sense, he's obviously acting a lot harder in Of Mice and Men because Shaney, you know, he might not have been Einstein, but, but he was certainly not um, unintelligent. And so he has to act pretty hard to play this mentally challenged man and do it plausibly. Whereas in the Wolfman films, I think it could be argued he, he's playing a version of himself, you know, in the way that you'll see today a Jack Nicholson film and you'll say, okay, in this one he's basically playing Jack, but in this one he's playing Jimmy Hoffa. He's haunted. Mm-hmm. Well, Cheney was haunted. He was haunted by, by the legacy of his father, the rejection of his father, at some points being shuffled around from home to home. Um, his parents divorced when he was quite young, being raised at one point by his deaf, mute grandparents. Okay, so Cheney knew sign language, and I've seen TV interviews where, where he's talking about, uh, um, you know, uh, greater send opportunities for the deaf, and he's doing some signing. Much more complicated uh, man than, than a lot of the writers and scholars out there would, would have you believe. They, they tend to give him short trip. They'll talk about the brilliance of Karloff. Granted, they'll talk about the brilliance of Lugosi granted again. But think about this. Uh, For an American movie viewer, Cheney didn't have the benefit of either of those accents, you know, or of the Karloff look of face and stature, uh, particularly his stature in a movie like The Black Cat, where he looks like, my God, some kind of a demigod, you know, when he rises from the bed with his broad shoulders and, and, and thin waist. He didn't have the bearing of a Bela Lugosi. In some ways, those were natural gifts for those men, not to take anything away from their considerable talents, from their genius. Karloff and Lugosi were geniuses. But Cheney was a real hard-working actor who had to, um, in some ways, work harder than they did, uh, especially for American audiences, to make himself special, because in some ways, he was an everyman. He was a big guy. He was tall. He had the broad shoulders. But, but he, he sounded like us. He's from Oklahoma, and he sounded like an American. And this can easily segue us into uh, talking about Son of Dracula and some of the mistakes there, which I would say were not Cheney's, but the screenwriters. But before we do that, yeah, the Wolfman. Um, so from A Mice and Men to The Wolfman, the common thread there uh, is, is got to be uh, viewer empathy for the character. You know, tragic characters. Characters who, through no fault of their own, are, are really suffering the, the trials of Job, uh, are cursed, be it the curse, Lenny's curse of his, his mental retardation and the, and, and the fact that uh, mean people, nasty bullies like the ranch owner's son, a uh, little guy with a Napoleon complex, just wants to hurt him, just wants to prove his own uh, value and worth by beating up on Lenny. Uh, and then to Talbot, who, as I said before, um, does a good deed and no good deed goes unpunished. He uh, he pays the ultimate price, uh, an eternal curse. I can, I can see the through line there, and that's a, a interesting way to look at it. I think a lot of Cheney's performances, especially with the Wolfman, you, you see this kind of put upon from from the outside or something external of him. This put uponness of doing in his performance and his characters, yeah. and that is one of the things that I do like about Cheney is that you can see. In his performances, here's this guy, and he's just dealing with all these things that are happening to him, and he's just doing the best that he can. Right, right. You know, and, and throughout much of the Wolfman series, he just wants to die. He, he feels so guilt-ridden for, for the uh, 
murders that his alter ego has committed. He's actually a much more moral character, Dr. Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll is responsible for the monster. Often people have said the monster in those films isn't Hyde, it's Jekyll. Hyde, does, you know, Hyde is doing what Hyde does. It's kind of not his fault. And Jekyll, Jekyll let him out of the cage. Hyde. On purpose. On purpose. He let him out of the cage. Yeah. Right, right, right. Or you could even say, who's the monster, Dr. Frankenstein right. or, or the monster? And, and a lot of people would answer, it's Dr. Frankenstein. The monster is his being who's a little different with the wolf yeah. man. Isn't it? Talbot doesn't create the wolf man. Talbot tries to save a life and pays for that good deed for the rest of his natural life. Finally gets cured at the end of House of Dracula and then a comedy. <laughs> I wish they had had a little guard at the beginning saying, shortly before the events of House of Dracula, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so that we could see Evan Costello meet Frankenstein, even though obviously it's not uh, completely within the series. Um, suddenly there he is, and apparently uh, Onslow Stevens, yeah, suddenly Edelman's cure has worn off. Well, that was one of the reasons why at 13 I started working on the short film Blood of the Wolfman. It's like, no, we're going to re-cure him, yeah. and this time for good. And it's not science, it's voodoo that does in that film, and it takes, and, and uh, ultimately what he needs to be cured of in that film, my short film Blood of the Wolfman, which won an international prize and got screened in Greece. He has to be cured of his own guilt, his son can't, he can't throw off the curse right. until he forgives himself. That was the idea from the beginning. When I was 13 and first scripting it, that was the idea. So um, I, I, <laughs> had I been reading some psychology today at 13? I don't know. But I, I think it's a valid uh, a take on, on the whole Talbot Wolfman curse, that it's beyond the supernatural. It's not really about reshaping his skull like they did in House of Dracula. It's more about until you forgive yourself for these acts, you're, you're going to keep, um, keep committing them. One of the things that, I mean, I really like Abbott and Costello and me, Frankenstein. I think it's a fun comedy. It's a great movie of the two. When fun. Talbot it's shows fun. up in that film and he's still cursed, it is – so it's it's disheartening because you've been with this character through the yeah. Wolfman, Wolfman Free Frankenstein, the house movies. You've been with this character this whole time. He's trying to free himself. And at the end of, of that particular cycle, he's cured. Like you said, he's good to go. He can now go on, yeah. live his yeah. life. He's got the girl. Marry the girl. Putting this behind him. He's even destroyed the Frankenstein yes, monster you know, and, and, at the end. Yeah, I mean, he's... Okay which is a way of beautifully yes. ending that whole cycle of film. And yeah. then it goes later. Yeah. It, it's bad. And it's so disheartening. <laughs> not right. because you're like, oh man, you know, they, they brought him back again, not because you're confused or, yeah. or you're upset that they did something to the story, but because of Cheney's performance as, as the Wolfman. He's gone through right. so much right. already. Right. And he's got to do it again. Right. Well, if there's money to be made, you know, they will go once more to the till. And yes, it's a fun movie. I just, as I said before, I wish they'd had a little title card that said, <laughs> you know, shortly before the events of House of Dracula, dot, dot, dot. And then it becomes a prequel to House of Dracula, and then we're good. But Talbot sympathizers, not to worry. I cured him once and for all with... Uh, so let's with talk about that. This was a movie that you made. Uh, how old were you sure. when you first started this one? Started it at 13 and ended it uh, in my uh, mid 40s. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go through pages of yeah. old famous monsters of Filmland magazines, Castle of Frankenstein magazines, you'll read stories about yeah. monster kids, about people making their own movies. There's a DVD collection yeah. out there called, I believe, Monster Kid Home Movies. Yeah, that that yeah, is I've with people that. who grew yeah. up watching these movies, wanting to make their own. Yeah. I, and I did it with video when I was a kid. Right. So. It's fascinating that yeah. to me that these monster movies engendered such creativity and drive and wanting to make movies. I want to hear about Blood of the Wolfman. Yeah. I've watched it twice now. What, what, what yeah. can we tell people about Blood okay. of the Wolfman? First, the big picture. Like I said, I made about fifty of these movies. My in nineteen seventy uh, two or three, my dad got a Super Eight camera and no longer needed his Standard Eight. Uh, for those of you who who don't know, Standard Eight was a sixteen millimeter uh, roll of film that you shot half of. Well, you shot it from start to finish, and then you had to go into a dark room, open the camera, put the reels around, and shoot the other side of it. And then at the lab, they would split it into two, and you have your standard eight. So kind of a hassle. But to me, just an epiphany to have a movie camera in my hands who had grown up watching movies and wanting to make them. And I just took off, you know. 
and um, and then cut to 40 some years later, I've resurrected a whole bunch of these under the uh, heading No Budget Theater, which has become um, a cult classic here in Chicagoland on cable TV. And I've entered a number of these films in contests and festivals and won one international prize and uh, two or three, I think three national prizes and a bunch of regionals because I'm not just showing them the way that they were shot by 13, 14, 15 year olds, these horror and sci-fi films. But I've gone back in recent years and shot a little new footage, re-edited them and added sound because these were all shot as silent and turned them into, I think, something pretty neat and, and, and something pretty special. And in some ways, Blood of the Wolfman means more to me than any of the other ones. It was a chance to cure Talbinson for all, not just of the curse, but of the guilt attached to it. And also to do a voodoo movie because you know, that was a major interest of mine. It still is. I love Hollywood voodoo, but I also um, am really interested in the real phenomenon, which is quite different from the way that Hollywood has, has <laughs> sort of stereotyped and, and downgraded it and, and into just a form of black magic. And so voodoo is a positive force for the most part in Blood of the Wolf. The negative of it is represented by Baron Sambi, the trickster, who is intent on keeping the wolfman the wolfman, whereas Evelyn Laveau, daughter of uh, real-life voodoo priestess Marie Laveau, um, become uh, the, the, uh, the Dr. Numan, the Dr. Edelman, the one that Larry turns to this time for help. And she has no ulterior motives, and she does not have a nasty alter ego like Edelman, and so she's able to, uh, to actually finally, after a lot of effort, affect the cure, um, and also becomes Larry's, Larry's love interest in the process. The film has particular meaning for me because it was one of many, many films that I made around that age, 13, 14, 15, um, that, that stored uh, my kind of proto-girlfriend and then first ever girlfriend, Julia, and she played Evelyn Laveau to my Talbot. And um, sadly, uh, her life was cut very short, age 20. Um, she had, when she was in college, she was raped by a stranger and, um, and then six months later uh, took her own life. Um, as a result of the, the trauma and the, the post-traumatic stress, uh, the depression. And so when I went back and re-engaged with Blood of the Wolfman decades later, um, it was as someone who, A, has done a lot of work, does a lot of work in rape prevention and um, rape outreach and advocacy against sexual violence because of what happened to Julia. And uh, B, it was as someone who was seeing new things in this I shot mostly at 13. About 90% of it was shot when I was 13. The rest was shot, uh, again, in my mid-40s, kind of, um, to, to, to make the, the re-edited version of the film work. We needed some connecting shots and sequence, um, or maybe more like 85, 15. But when I came back to the material, given what happened with Julia, I saw, I saw the Wolfman in a new light. I saw this notion of the curse of violence in a new light and, uh, you know, the inescapability of the violent nature uh, not just of, 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 of wolf, but of man. And, you know, I'm reading from the script here, but uh, you've got Larry doing his usual, I can't take much more of this. How much more blood must I spill? How many more lives must I take? How long, how long must I wait to be freed of this terrible curse? And that's very close to the kinds of things that he was saying and certainly thinking throughout the Cheney Wolfman films. But then we've got Baron Samdi as the kind of evil trickster force that wants to keep this going. And he's taunting the Wolfman with lines like, look into my eyes, beast, and see your legacy, murder, mayhem, and death, men, women, children, victims, all of your savage lust. This is who you are, who you will always be. The girl cannot save you. And when she sees for herself what you have done, she will be disgusted and turn on you. You must stop her, beast, before she stops you. Follow me. Baron C will lead you to her. And uh, so he wants the wolfman to kill the girl. And in real life, the girl died. But one of the wonderful things about movies is you can change it. You can change it and maybe um, affect some sort of redemption. And every time that I've re-edited and revisited a movie that Julia and I were in, um, it's been a way to uh, kind of revisit and, and deem and change the reality. Um, at least on screen for 15 minutes uh, of, of the tragedy of, of, of her short life. 
I also re- reclaimed her as the teenager that, that I dated, my first girlfriend, in, in my novel Planet of the Dates, which came out in 2008 and it's optioned in Hollywood. And, um, you know, the, the character Stephanie Scum is, is based on Julia as she was at 16 and 17 before uh, the terrible stuff that came her way. And so this is a very serious and dark place for us to be going in a, in a podcast interview about monster movies, and I recognize that. But I think that some of the power of horror films and monster films is that they are allegories for the real-life violence and the real-life loss, the real curse uh, or curses with which real-life people have to struggle. Um, murder and rape and, and, and genocide. And there are real atrocities and real horrors to which um, our vampire tales can't hold a candle. But sometimes those tales are a way to think about the real life horrors in new ways and even. Sure. I mean, I think them. horror movies, especially monster movies, especially, give us a, a, pl- a place to safely yeah. explore some of these things and, and process some of these yeah. things. And, and I think this story. That's right. I mean, I liked Blood of the Wolfman when I watched it the first time around, and then you shared with me what had happened, and and it, it does the story on Julia, yeah, get a different light on the movie that you made as a kid, and, and the movie that you re-edited then as an adult uh, yeah. afterwards, and it's it, it's an important story that I think too many people live through. It's this. You know, and and like you said, yeah, it's a monster movie podcast, so we don't want to get too dark about it. But it's also very, very important. And I do want to mention real quick: you are involved with Rain. Yeah, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, which is the nation's largest anti-social violence organization, and according to Worth Magazine, um, one of the 100 best charities in the country. For one thing, one thing that they use to judge that is um, how much of every dollar goes to sure. the delivery of services, and it's virtually all. They keep their overhead really low, but I mean, they've got this multi-pronged attack. They're working on education to prevent rapes, abuse, and, and, and sexual assaults. They're also doing direct counseling through 24-7 um, online and phone hotlines, whichever um, um, victims prefer. They're helping victims turn into survivors. This, you know, this, this language is important. And the PC term is survivor, but I can never use that term about Julia because she didn't survive. She was a victim. She was a victim of rape, and then she and then she stepped off the roof of the tallest dorm building on her campus. You know, and 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 so I'm doing what I can through Rain to help uh, Julia's of today and tomorrow not take that wrong step, but step back from that brink and, and get the help that they need. And uh, Rain also works on advocacy for legislation related to, uh, uh, you know, to these issues. And uh, I think it also assists in the prosecution of, uh, of rapists and, and uh, their sexual um, assailants. So I'm also a member of their National Leadership Council, which, just to bring it all back to horror movies, is chaired by Christina Ricci, <laughs> a.k.a. Wednesday. There you go. Well, I will make sure to get to <laughs> Rain's website in this Yes, in the show notes over at monstersradio.net. So right. if people are interested in either getting involved or getting help, make sure you head over to that website and check into that and yeah, do something. That's right. So. Their uh, uh, 24-7 um, hotline is 800-656-HOPE. So we'll make sure there's there's a way for people to look into that and get involved if they are interested in doing so. We're going to come back in a couple of days for part two of that discussion with Paul McComas, where we're going to talk about uh, one of cinema's early goth girls, the film Son of Dracula, some other movies, Jack Pierce, and, well, Fit for a Frankenstein. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys. And again, big thanks to Paul for taking some time out of his weekend to chat with us here at Monster Kid Radio. I do want to, on a serious note, just stress that if you are somebody who has been a victim of rape, abuse, or incest, Please do not hesitate to go to rain, R-A-I-N-N dot org to get help or see if you can help others and get involved like Paul has. There will be a link to that in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. 
Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivations, 3.0 unported license. That does not extend to the image we used for this episode of Monster Kid Radio. If you look at the episode image over at our website or in the iTunes store, you'll see a hand-drawn image of Lon Chaney Jr. That is a cover of an issue of Lonnie Jr. drawn by Paul McComas, and it appears with his permission. Also appearing in this episode of Monster Kid Radio, with the permission of the band Atomic Mosquitoes, is the song Planet from Outer Space from their album Release the Mosquitoes. Talk to you in a couple of days. (laughs) 